Um, thank you very much. Um, looking forward to a, a good discussion. Um, I think, um, I'm, and I hope all of you know my organization, Amnesty International. Um, many of you may know that it is, uh, or, or link it and associate it with the term prisoner of conscience, which is um, uh, the people who are arrested for the nonviolent expression of um, their opinions. Um, and the, while the identity of the organization and the focus is still very much uh, linked to the importance or the primacy of having an individual to focus people's attentions on, there's always been the understanding that individuals were only the un entry point to larger structural human rights challenges. Uh, in other words, if you free your prisoner of conscience today and you don't address the conditions and environment that he, he or she is in, they'll be arrested in a month or they'll be detained in a month. In other words, the cycle continues. So there's a larger imperative to address the, 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 the context and the, the drivers of, of human rights violations which I think leads to the discussion of um, drivers of conflict, which Doreen just mentioned, which of course um, is, is key and important to national security. Um, Amnesty International uh, has, since its start in 1961, always understood that the rule of law and human rights were almost baseline pillars of um, stable societies and stable governments. Um, and history I'm, uh, continues to reiterate that point that countries where you don't have the rule of law, where you don't have the respect for human rights, where you don't have accountability, independent institutions, um, uh, a free and robust civil society, a professional uh, security sector, both police and as well as military, are, are often the same societies and countries that suffer um, destabilization and conflict and inevitably violence. Um, and my portfolio, Sub-Saharan Africa, is unfortunately uh, full of many case studies. You've had Liberia, you've had the Democratic Republic of the Congo, you've had Sierra Leone, um, you've had conflicts in, um, in, the, in Cote d'Ivoire. Um, you still have uh, crises in, in Somalia, uh, the former Somalia. Um, and, and so for us, the analysis of why the human rights issues that may sometimes be considered irritants or small fish or, 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 or middling issues are actually not because they're the precursors to chains of events that lead to larger human rights crises where the international community and key partners like the United States then end up having not only um, a situation which has already blown up, but then you are dealing with the, with the, the consequences of, of violence, of a, of a lack of faith in the state, um, I, either internally displaced or refugee populations, and um, the loss of livelihoods. Um, income, development, all of those which then contribute to cycles of poverty, which in turn reinforce political fragility. Um, I think one of the things that I have, have learned um, while doing this work is that um, governments around the world have always a, a challenging task of legitimacy. Um, they can either rule by, by fear and violence and control of force, or they can be legitimate, democratically elected in some form or another, um, where the perception of them is considered to be accountable. In other words, they are considered to be working for the national interest and not promoting one sector, one ethnic group, or one institution. Um, and those governments which are considered predatory and use authoritarian methods to remain in control um, are the ones that thrive on the lack of accountability and 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 pay uh, lip service if at all to good governance um, they are the ones uh, for example that uh, 
control the judiciary system. In other words, where the courts are not perceived to be independent and certainly do not challenge um, the, the ruling class and the allies of the ruling class. Um, they are the ones usually where the military are closely linked, controlled, um, uh, subservient to not the government but the executive. The executive is considered almost over and above the, the cabinets, the institutions, um, and in some cases takes upon themselves the definition that they represent the state. Um, you could have an example of that, for example, in Uganda, where the president, uh, President Museveni, um, has regularly dismissed the idea of n anyone else but him being a legitimate president because he says there's no capacity in the whole country to, to be president. Um, now, M Museveni, of course, came to power through an, an armed struggle and ousted um, uh, a fairly disappointing predecessor. Um, and there's a history of, of, of ethnic violence and competition, but um, the, the assumption that he's the only person who can run the country and navigate Uganda's challenges, as you can see, will create not only a, a opacity, but it basically means that his decisions and his appointees are above the law and they're not accountable. And that disenfranchises people and the ones who are not able or who are not on the inside to negotiate their interest or, or their treatment will tend to be the ones uh, excluded and the ones who turn potentially to um, extre extreme methods or violent methods of, of trying to oust uh, a Museveni or something like that. Um, another example would be the situation in Cameroon where you've had the head of state, Paul Bia, who's been in power for well over 20 years um, and where there is clearly a lack of accountability and independence of, um, certainly the judiciary is very much controlled by the ruling party. Um, the, the country had uh, the, the, the double challenge of being colonized by both Anglophone and Francophone interests, and that has created a division between the two, the northern and the southern half of the country, and the, the English-speaking Anglophone side, uh, or the Anglophone side of it, is very much disempowered and marginalized, and there is no accountability for human rights violations to that part of the, of the country. So the, the legitimacy and the health of governance, the, the buy-in, the, the um, acceptance, and, and the, the level of security and stability in a country is directly impacted by the legitimacy and the way the government does its business and how it treats its citizens. The other um, key driver I think that accountability and governance issues um, impact or, or, or connect with, of course, is the issue of corruption and the, the control of wealth. Um, when you don't have judiciaries that can ask questions, um, that can investigate, and that can prosecute basic corruption, the system tends to, I, I would argue, just permeate and create a culture of impunity. Um, one of the, the, the most striking examples is Nigeria, where you, you have a history of, of, of economic corruption because of a weak federal government and even weaker financial oversight, um, and where there's a direct link uh, in the performance of the security forces. Uh, all of you are aware of the Boko Haram insurgency in the northeastern part of the country. Um, the insurgency began or, or metamorphed uh, uh, into this larger crisis when the Nigerian authorities decided to crack down and arrest um, an Islamic extremist leader in the north in in in, uh, in Bornu State. That in and and the treatment of that leader. Uh, in, inflamed his supporters, which is no surprise. But the level of violence that was inflicted in terms of, their, of the security force crackdown directly set up a trend of events of counter-violence and basically arguably set the, the country on a path where you had an armed uh, insurgency that is now challenging the country and challenging the region. Boko Haram was initially linked to edu education and, and some some altruistic activities, and but it was also always linked with a, a fairly extreme view of 
of uh, the, the, the need for Sharia law and, and accountability. But it was also in response to the lack of accountability and the lack of services and the violence the violent nature of the crackdown by the Nigerian security forces against the, the leader of the group. That in turn led to them taking up arms and them beginning to, to actually attack facilities such as post offices, schools, and government, government buildings, and then of course uh, the beginning of the abductions of civilians, including women and girls. The Nigerian uh, crisis further got worse because there was an ongoing issue of corruption within the military in terms of basic supplies and salaries. Um, at, at certain points in the, in the last three or four years, there have been numerous reports about Nigerian soldiers not having enough weapons or bullets to fight when encountering Boko Haram fighters. Um, this obviously means that there were, there's no question about salaries. Um, people were not being paid, people were not being equipped, which led to dramatic reversals and defeats and embarrassment and, a, and successes for Boko Haram, which all, I would argue brought down the good luck Jonathan regime, um, but also led to Boko Haram being successful in destabilizing Cameroon and parts of Chad and Niger. And you now have a regional, um, uh, a regional threat. Um, you don't seem to have um, accurate intelligence about where they are, how strong they are. Um, and the Nigerian security forces and the government continue to say that victory is not, uh, is, is, is coming. They're, they're winning successfully, but the, uh, you still have close to 2 million people who are dis, uh, internally displaced. And uh, I would argue you, you don't have uh, economic activity. You have a famine. Boko Haram is basically destabilized and succeeding to destabilize Nigeria, despite what the government can say. That is the kind, that, that, that may be the worst case scenario, but it is indicative, I think, of a, a lack of transparency within the military, a lack of transparency within the government to question what the military was doing, and a lack of governance. Um, in other words, there was no effective federal governance in the northern parts of the, uh, the northern states where Boko Haram arose and that in turn led to grievances and that in turn led to the, the conflict. Another uh, example I think that is current and, and one that um, the, 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 the U.S. government is aware of um, uh, is the crisis in Ethiopia. Um, in Ethiopia you have um, uh, a dictatorial state, um, you have um, controlled by the uh, TPLF-led um, uh, government, um, and you have uh, a, f uh, a very sophisticated political machine that deliberately s divided the country along ethnic lines um, and has created um, a, a system of representation that divides most of the non-Tigrayan um, population and allows the Tigrayan-led uh, uh, ruling government to control parliament and to control the presidency, and of course to maintain control of the armed forces. During the last three years, there has been um, uh, a s on ongoing unrest um, around um, government decisions to try to appropriate land, in particular land around the capital, Addis Ababa. That land was um, uh, traditionally Oromo land, which is the, the largest ethnic group in Ethiopia. And the Oromo, surprise, surprise, were not very happy to see their traditional land being appropriated by the Tigrayans and also by the, the federal government, which they feel has marginalized and minimized their political participation in the, in the country's decisions. So they decided to start protest. The protest um, uh, were met with violence. Um, we do not have access to the country. In fact, human rights groups are not allowed into Ethiopia. So the estimates are based on interviews as well as uh, input from people inside the country. But I think it's safe to say that well over a thousand people have been killed in the last two and a half years. Um, 
and uh, this was before the state of emergency was declared in the fall of 2016. Uh, the government itself has admitted it has detained over 10,000 people since the state of emergency was declared and has at least acknowledged that there have been some problems in how they respond to the uh, protest and the uprisings. What does the Ethiopian model say about uh, say about governance and accountability? First, it talks of it, 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 it's an it's illustrative of the lack of transparency. You may not you, you you don't need to have an Amnesty International or Human Rights Watch in the country to verify that there have been human rights abuses. I don't think we're calling for that. But you have to have Ethiopian independent human rights organizations that can investigate and, and, and basically confirm details of events. That is not being allowed to happen because of the government's laws and restrictions on civil society organizations. Um, the government also has laws restricting media reporting. It has detained journalists. It has shut down um, bar associations and, and, and legal organizations designed to, to, uh, to, to try to help citizens uh, challenge government over their grievances. Um, the transparency issue in Ethiopia is massive. We still don't have an accurate figure of the number of people outside of the 10,000 who were political prisoners before the uprising started in 2014. The other issue is investigations. Um, has there been any effective investigation into incidents that the government itself acknowledges has, has happened? No. Um, we have spent a lot of time working with um, the Department of State and the White House, urging them to push the Ethiopian authorities to allow an independent commission of inquiry, something that would be able to say, this is what happened on the side of the government, this is what the protesters did. It was not always nonviolent, but this is, th this is who is responsible for what, and this is what we recommend should happen to the people who instigate the violence and the damage. The Ethiopian government has rejected that. What does that contribute to Ethiopia's security and stability? Well, it has, um, I, I would say, it has hardened the diaspora communities, outs Ethiopian diaspora communities outside of the country, particularly the non-Tigrayan who see the government as basically being um, a, a clique that is interested in maintaining its authority and control irrespective of the human cost. Um, it has probably hardened or, 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 or limited the space um, for nonviolent debate and dialogue because the Ethiopian government has arrested most of the leadership of human rights organizations and political opposition. Um, and it has um, arguably put the country on a, on a course where violence is inevitable. What the scale will be, we can't predict, but unless something dramatic happens in Ethiopia, one of the key allies for the United States in the region, a key economy on the continent, certainly an important country um, on, on many different fronts, um, but one that has gone through civil war before. The, the, the society has broken down, and this has been, hopefully, this was to have been the rebuilding of a democratic, stable country. And now I would argue that Ethiopia is very much at risk. Um, I don't know the timeline, but um, the, the, there's no one, um, I suspect here in Washington or in Addis Ababa, who can actually see a, a way forward in terms of how, how to negotiate things down so that you actually have dialogue over more inclusive government. Ethiopia is, 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 is an area that I've been focusing on for the last three years and, I, and, I, and that's one I wanted to make sure that I shared with you because it's, it's ticking, um, so to speak. Um, the, um, but just to sort of go back again, um, I think that the governance and the, and the rules of, in ways in which governments um, behave and comport themselves are, are incredibly important to, national, to the security and the stability of countries. Um, Africa, uh, after most of the countries became independent, had a non-intervention policy that was um, one of the planks of the Organization of African Unity. In other words, if Ghana was doing something bad next door to Togo,
um, the Togolese weren't supposed to say anything about it, or, and the Ghanaians weren't supposed to say anything about um, that. That broke down because in, in, in too many cases, internal chaos in the neighboring country impacted the stability of a country next to it and forced them to intervene, to speak up, to send peacekeeping troops, um, to condemn uh, acts of, 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 uh, of violence. In other words, to be what we all know we need to be sometimes, neighbors, um, and to, be, to basically um, accept that there's a collective good that needs to be upheld um, and protected. And the, the, but there has still been a lag in the governance and accountability benchmarks, which are the smaller um, or I would say the, the less exotic, dramatic interventions that can sometimes prevent crises from fully erupting. Um, but those at least, that, that process of having to engage has begun to be, to be more accepted. Um, the African Union has set up different kinds of structures to try to respond to crises and to try to collaborate interventions. Your regional bodies, uh, ECOWAS, SADC, um, have engaged in interventions to try to prevent human rights violations uh, triggered by bad, uh, by, by a lack of good governance and a lack of accountability. Um, but one key driver, I think, has been the inconsistency coming from uh, foreign and Western donors. Um, and I think this is one of the challenges that we face now. Um, if you if, if, if your donors turn are, are indifferent to the governance within a country, or if the donors and, ally, uh, and friends of a country presume on the assumption that their contact or their point of contact with a country can be narrowly limited to, let's say, the military and nothing else, um, the distortions that come with that are, are very real and very significant. Um, for example, assistance and training programs, which we all agree are incredibly important in terms of professionalizing security forces. No question, that is absolutely badly needed and is a in need of constant, constant attention as well as resourcing. But those don't happen in a vacuum. Um, you can have people trained in UN standards, in the best kind of practices in terms of, of, uh, of, of transparency, of management, of, of military discipline, whatever you want to call it. But if, there's, if the, the, the surrounding context is not addressed or focused on, you're, you're basically throwing away money. And in some cases, you may actually be distorting the internal politics of a country. Because whether you like it or not, the, the interaction between a military and a foreign donor is a sign of legitimacy. It is a sign of endorsement. And that strengthens that particular institution in that country. So if you have a, a, a military that is doing great work in peacekeeping, but then comes back and beats up its own population, continuing engagement with no questions asked, um, I would argue, creates problems. And if can that engagement continues with no questions asked or no engagement with the larger judicial system, then it becomes a much bigger problem because the rest of the society is being um, uh, sort of told that their needs, their accountability are, are secondary and not important. Um, we um, uh, tend to try to make this case with um, both um, you know, the Department of State, but with, uh, with Congress in particular, and keep on stressing that the, the, the U.S. engagement with African countries has to be comprehensive. It has to basically take into account strengthening civil society, strengthening institutions, strengthening democratic practices, um, as well as strengthening militaries. Um, and on a good day, we, we, I would say maybe we, we, have, we have some support. On, on bad days, um, we, we have people who say um, the concerns here are, are security. 
and we need people who can go and 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 beat uh, extremist armed organizations. Um, and it's a it we counter that, and we would say that that's a very very short term. Um, uh, transient victory that you're trying you're going to get because you're not strengthening anything that's going to go beyond one particular victory um, and certainly it's not going to be anything that you're going to be able to walk away from um, and that's going to be able to sustain itself uh, but I that 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 leads me to another big challenge I think that we're that we're facing in terms of accountability and governance and that's the whole um, war on terror paradigm um, Prior to the 9/11 uh, um, attacks here in the United States, I think it would—I I think it's safe to say that the United States did have a more nuanced uh, sense of um, of what its priorities were in terms of uh, of Africa and and governance, um, and what what people people wanted to see there. They did want to see democratic um, law rule uh, law abiding um, areas that. You know, ideally, would eventually become potential markets and partners for the United States. Absolutely legitimate national national interest for any country. Um, the 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 war on terror has changed that very very significantly, in that it is now very much a security oriented approach that seeks to contain, limit, and prevent the spread of violent extremism from coming out of Africa and ideally should, should actually be defeated within Africa. Um, that has, has in turn led to a focus on capacity to wage counterterrorism, um, not to build democracy or to build institutions, but to defeat terrorism and terrorism and, and terrorist organizations that are, uh, are considered threats. So your Boko Haram, your Al Shabab, um, uh, your um, Al Qaeda in in the Maghreb, all of those kinds of, of 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 entities are now being targeted and are now the priority for the U.S. relationships and interventions. What the casualties of that have been? The uh, democracy, the rule, the rule of law programs, the the um, communications, independent press programs. They're still there, but they are definitely at risk and they are not the first and foremost things people talk about. And if there is indeed a budget that needs to be cut, those are the ones that go first. What is that? That, that, that contributes to what I've just said, which is there, there's a distortion in the assistance and the intervention and the relationships. And those, in turn, come back later on because they're, all of those are institutions that can help prevent dis the rise of extremist groups. They can mitigate grievances. They can, they can help challenge the lack of governance or the lack of accountability of, 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 of governments. Um, and I think that that's one of the, one of the, the most unspoken uh, largest tragedies of the, the post 9/11 foreign policy period. So um, I think um, what I, what I, what I'll, I'll sort of wrap up by saying is that there are many governance and 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 accountability are are key drivers certainly in Africa because of the the, the fragility of the states and those and and and. Human rights is just a, at the bottom. It's almost I, I think think of it as the kind of the baseline because it's not linked to a particular system of governance, but it is linked to behavior and and expectations and 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 fundamental respect. Um, and if we don't prioritize those two agenda items um, and empower Africans themselves in these countries. To feel entitled and and fight for those issues, then we don't have a sustainable trend of democracy and human rights, and we do, and we have inherent stability issues going forward. So that's my pitch. Um, I'd love to hear your comments and critiques. Okay.